Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 3rd, 2009. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, making the most out of Mr. Beer. Now wait, don't hit that skip button on your listening device. Hear me out. This time of year, Mr. Beer shows up in Bed Bath & Beyond and other places. And we're going to talk to Derek Johnson, an experienced Mr. Beer user and a graduate to more advanced brewing on how brewers who discover home brewing through Mr. Beer can up their game. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter, my username, Basic Brewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And you can find our shows on facebook.com slash basicbrewing. And I'll be sending out notices when new shows are posted. So become, uh, become a fan there. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us bring you this show. And we appreciate your support greatly, especially during this holiday season. Y'all are just wearing that button out, and we appreciate it greatly. Uh, we also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. And both of those make awesome Christmas gifts as well. And continuing the shameless plugging, our 2010 Brewers Logbooks are here, and they need to be in your house, in your brewery. Don't get caught at the beginning of the year without one. Go to our site and pick one up. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. I had a good response after last week's show from from brewers who have tips on making the most out of pumpkin You'll remember last week we asserted through an experiment that adding pumpkin to the mash doesn't necessarily give you much pumpkininess in your beer. But here are some methods recommended by listeners on how to improve that. The first letter comes from Brad. And an interesting thing about uh, about these, hardly anybody wanted to say exactly where they were. Uh, Brad's apparently up here, in, uh, up in Canada. He says, up here in Canada, Thanksgiving is several months gone by now. <laughs> they got the jump. Of course, it's colder up there. You know, you got to get the jump on Thanksgiving up there. Uh, anyway, Brad says, anyway, my technique for making pumpkin ales adds a definite vegetal character, which plays very nicely with a subtle late hopping and characterful, moderately attenuative English yeasts. That sounds tasty. Uh, Brad says, for this year's batch, I used three 700 milliliter cans of pumpkin, which I roasted in the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit until very dark or nearly black. So lots of caramelization there. And then Brad says, I then added this to the boil and not the mash. My reasoning is that I'm not looking for simple sugar contribution from the pumpkin. I'm looking for flavor. In any case, there's really not much in pumpkin that could be converted to sugars. The label indicates that there's only a few tablespoons worth of starches in the entire can. Any starches and or uh, other associated vegetable material there are quickly or there are quickly falls out into the tube yielding a fearsome layer on the bottom of the kettle and carboil, uh, carboy with a clear beer on top. Brad says, I lost, f- I lost four gallons out of 12 total this year to Troub. Wow. Uh, whether heavily or lightly roasted, I have noticed that pumpkin in the boil adds a pleasing orangish to reddish color to the beer and foam. So there you go. Roast the heck out of it and put it in the boil, according to Brad. This comes from William. Uh, I made a few pumpkin beers with pumpkin pie filling. I use one large can, and the results are very good. I steep water, about half a gallon, with cloves, cinnamon sticks, allspice, and honey separately. I put the can of pumpkin in during the main boil and leave it in the primary. 
when I rack it to secondary, it leaves all the sludge behind. Uh, William says, this is always my wife's favorite homebrew, and to me it's like licking a pumpkin pie. I prefer just biting right into it, but you know. Uh, <laughs> he says, he says the taste is medium to strong pumpkin, and that's the way I prefer it. Well, thanks, William. Chris weighs in with this. I've attempted to make a pumpkin beer for the last two years. The first year I used pumpkin and got little flavor addition at all from the pumpkin, but all from the spices which I added at bottling. This year, however, I added Loran Pumpkin Super Strength Flavor Candy Making Oil. Once again, that's Loran, L-O-R-A-N-N, Pumpkin Super Strength Flavor Candy Making Oil. This gave the beer an intense but not too overpowering pumpkin flavor, which along with the spices I added was pumpkin pie heaven. I have used these oils in a few other beers as well. Watermelon in a watermelon wheat beer, chocolate mint in a chocolate mint stout, pecan in a pecan nut brown, etc. The only downside is that they are oil, so you have to adjust your carbonation accordingly as oils decrease head retention in the beer. But that also helps to avoid overcarbonation, which I tend to accidentally do often in my beers. So that again, that's Loran Pumpkin Super Strength Flavor Candy Making Oil. Thanks, Chris. John from Chicago. John's proud of being in Chicago. Writes in with some advice. John says. Uh, I thought I'd share my recent pumpkin beer experience in light of last week's podcast. I've never been a huge fan of pumpkin beers because the pumpkin pie flavor that you described as the goal in the beer has never been something I loved. I love the pie, incidentally, but not the overly cloying pumpkin pie flavor that seems to be in many pumpkin beers. Uh, John says, in any event, I recently brewed a pumpkin beer that used about double the amount of pumpkin used in your recent experiment. My girlfriend and I roasted seven small pumpkins weighing probably 15 to 20 pounds. We cut them in half and brought them up to a lightly caramelized state. We then cut the pumpkin into roughly one cubic inch chunks, placed them in a hop bag, then steep them with the rest of our grains for 90 minutes at about 155 degrees. We used a very plain pale ale recipe for our grain bill. We added one teaspoon of pumpkin pie spice at flame out, added a half teaspoon to the secondary, and then a half teaspoon at bottling. So we're only talking one and a half teaspoons of total spice and none of the clove or other strong spices mentioned during the podcast. Essentially, I find pumpkin beers to be overly spiced, says John, which is why you seem to never actually be able to pick up the pumpkin itself when drinking the beer. We fermented in the primary with a 1056 starter for a week, then moved it to secondary for a week, then bottled. The beer is very clean and dry and tastes distinctly like pumpkin with only a hint of pumpkin pie spice. John says, I'm down to just a few bottles left because my friends can't stop asking for it. It was definitely one of my most successful brewing efforts of the year. So in any event, John says, I distinguish between a pumpkin beer and a pumpkin pie beer. I'd suggest that if someone wants a pumpkin beer, go heavy on the roasted pumpkin and use less pumpkin pie spice. So it's a balance issue, according to John. Uh, John says, if you want a beer that tastes like pumpkin pie, skip the pumpkin altogether and just use spices. Pumpkin is such a delicate flavor that you're not going to taste very much of it in a heavily spiced beer. Personally, I find the clean, less spicy pumpkin flavor to be preferable in the fall. Once Christmas hits, then I'm ready for some spice in my beer. So there you go. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody else, for writing in. Some excellent feedback from experienced pumpkin beer brewers. I appreciate it. Uh, One more letter, this one from Greg, who I think is in Vancouver. Uh, and he has another pie to try in addition to pumpkin and the sweet potato pie that Steve made in our video podcast. Greg says, carrot pie, my favorite. If you have a good pumpkin pie recipe, substitute cooked mashed carrots for the equal amount of pumpkin. 
add all the other spices, milk, eggs, etc., as normal. Very similar to pumpkin, but not nearly as watery. Also very dark. Cool. Sweet and good for your eyesight, I bet. And I have just a, a tip on pumpkin pie. I use the uh, just the Libby's uh, canned pumpkin myself, and I use the recipe on the back, but I use a trick that my mom used to do, and she would uh, separate the eggs and reserve the whites to the side, mix everything else together according to the can instructions, then you whip the egg whites into, you know, like a meringue almost, and then you fold that into all the rest of the ingredients and bake as prescribed by the can, and that thing will blow up. I mean, it will not blow up, but it'll it'll <laughs> it'll increase in volume, kind of like a souffle. And of course, it'll sink after you take it out of the oven; it cools a little bit. But man, that makes a very very light pumpkin pie that tastes delicious, and it's not so heavy. You know, you eat the big holiday meal and the last thing you want is a big old heavy pie in my opinion but whip those egg whites it'll fluff up and uh, be extremely delicious just my little cooking tip there for you now on to our interview in my chat with chris colby on a small on small space brewing uh, a few shows ago i mentioned fermenting with the mr beer plastic keg thingy And after that, I got a handful of emails from Mr. Beer users who thanked me for mentioning their chosen system of brewing. And they suggested that I do a show spotlighting Mr. Beer. Now, ever since we started, people have emailed me and, and, you know, asked me to do that. And I've resisted until now. Um, Because Mr. Beer has a bad reputation among, you know, quote, unquote, traditional home brewers out there. But one thing that you can say is that many beer lovers are introduced to homebrewing through a gift of one of these kits for Christmas. And my attitude is, if we can give them advice on how to improve their experience with that kit, then I think they have a better chance of sticking with it and moving on into more advanced methods. Derek Johnson is a brewer who has done just that. Well, Derek Johnson, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. Now, I know that that just looking at the title of this episode, which I think I'm going to call "Making Making the Most Out of Mister Beer," I know that there are going to be a lot of uh, home brewers that regularly listen to this podcast that are going to turn up their nose and be <laughs> extremely skeptical about our conversation and uh, sure there will be <laughs> as a mr beer user uh what is your what is your feel about that do you get kind of discrimination uh amongst uh, the homebrew community well you know for one thing i've definitely moved beyond just using mr beer i do occasionally make the mr beer recipe but i would say that 80 percent of mine are not mr beer specifically um it's just basically a great way to start how learning how to do the process getting your sanitation down your fermentation down and all that kind of thing but you could continue to make mr beer recipes for the rest of your life and be happy with it and but you will be looked down upon by the snobs out there (laughs) now i uh I have some background with with Mr. Beer, just in the interest of of full disclosure. Uh, Steve and I were approached a a few years ago uh, after we started doing our video podcasts uh, by the Mr. Beer marketing guy. He was a super nice guy, uh, and he wanted to talk to us about making uh, some training material to go either in or with the the kits. Mm -hmm. And we... Uh, he sent us some Mr. Beer kits and some ingredients, and we played around with it. And uh, I don't want to go into the details, but it just it just didn't happen. So we do we do have a background uh, with uh, the, using the Mr. Beer kits, uh, and I was actually kind of impressed at um, some of the things that they that they do. I wasn't necessarily impressed with the final product, but I only did a couple of recipes. So I I can't really judge 
uh, pass judgment on it just just from that. Um, well, I will say that Mr. Beer would probably do themselves a favor if they shipped it with a better recipe, their beginner's kits. Um, they basically have three levels of refills. There's the basic, the premium, and the deluxe. And the basic is just one can of hopped malt extract, and you get a patch of booster, which is basically um, corn syrup or corn sugar with some dextrin added. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get a great body on that type of beer, and that's what they ship with the kits. And I think it does turn off a lot of people because their first batch is just so-so. Now, I will say that you, the people, my Coors Light and Miller Light friends, uh, who usually don't like my homebrew because it's got too much flavor, uh, <laughs> they did enjoy uh, the the first recipe that came with the Mr. Beer Kit. So, uh, so maybe if you are, you know, kind of a uh, uh, a typical uh, light beer drinker, mm -hmm. it could be that that. Getting a, a kit where you make something like that would be a welcome thing. And they probably believe that that's the most approachable res recipe, too, because there are so many people out there who do drink the Miller Lights and the Bud Lights. So that's probably their thinking on that. But as someone who prefers something a little more robust, a little hoppier, it's not really going to be their cup of tea. So what's your what's your background in in uh, brewing beer and and how did you get involved with uh, with using a Mr. Beer kit? Well, um, I'm coming up on two years brewing, and basically every Christmas Bed Bath and Beyond carries Mr. Beer kits, and every January I've seen them go on clearance, and I always kind of scoffed at it myself, thinking, "Huh, you can't make good beer with that." But one year. They were marked down to about nine ninety nine, and I was, well, what the heck, let's give it a try. And the rest is history. I've got 167 batches under my belt now, and, you know, I've moved on away from the recipes. But like I say, I still do make them. I've got one in the fermenter right now. Um, but I mainly only use Mr. Beer ingredients when I'm short on time and I need to get just keep the pipeline full. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just... Bought it at Bed Bath & Beyond and fell in love with the whole process. And they do make it real easy to start with. Um, there's definitely some things in their instructions that you would want to do differently. Now, you are also uh, an administrator of a website having to do with uh, Mr. Beer, using Mr. Beer, right? Yeah, I'm involved in the um, forum called MrBeerFans.com. And we're just a small community, you know, it's... Not like homebrew talk with thousands and thousands of people. We've just got a couple of thousand people, and it's pretty active, though, and a lot of good people on there. And we basically just help each other out making the best beer we can. Now, one thing that you can say about uh, about Mr. Beer is that, I mean, they sell a, a load of kits. I mean, they, they told me how many kits that they sold, it, and that was a couple of years ago. I don't want to say just because they, that might be proprietary. But I was amazed at the number of kits that they sell. So, sure. I mean, this is a, this is uh, a, a perfect opportunity for people to get into home brewing because uh, if yes, I think too is you need to learn your processes, and this is a real simple way to get started and get your processes down. If you want to take it further from there, you can take it further from there. It's all up to the individual. So let's go over the the basic kit. I mean, if you if you I dug out my instructions from my box downstairs, uh, <laughs> inside the box or uh -huh. inside the kit that I got, uh, you get the the keg, the brewing keg, which is the fermenter, right? And it has a built-in spigot in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you get uh, the they call it beer mix. And brewing yeast, and that's actually a hopped extract, a hopped liquid extract, right? Correct. And there's just dry yeast under the lid. Mm -hmm. uh, you get plastic bottles and caps. You get labels with the Mr. Beer logo. Uh, one step cleanser that they use also as a sanitizer. Right. The booster, which you mentioned, is uh, uh, a mixture of both fermentable and unfermentable sugars. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the instruction book. So, 
the the first step, and and thank goodness, this is one of the things that I praise uh, in the kit. Is step number one is sanitizing. Yep. So they and they do market the one step as a cleaner, and they they do that for legal reasons. Um, the testing that it would have to undergo for to be called a sanitizer is something they've never gone through. But it's basically a no rent sanitizer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I prefer Star Stand, but there's nothing wrong with one step. It is a great sanitizer. <laughs> so you just scored some credibility points there, Derek, a little <laughs> bit with the Star Stand comment. Well, it's <laughs> 30 seconds and you've pretty much killed everything. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so they give instructions on on how to sanitize everything, everything, and they use they they have you mix the sanitizer in the keg. And then put everything that you're going to brew with in into the keg, so everything gets sanitized. Mm-hmm. Uh, step two is uh, brewing, and take us through the the typical uh, brewing uh, session with the with the basic Mister Beer kit. Someone doing the basic kit for the first time, it's really really simple. Um, they have made it very simple. Um, basically. Just off the top of my head, I haven't really brewed the, this process for a while. Um, you just bring four cups of water to a boil, um, remove it from the heat, pour in the malt extract. Oh, I'm sorry, I actually skipped. For the basic recipe, you're going to dissolve the booster in the water first and then bring it to a boil. Then put in your hopped malt extract and give it a good stirring. You're putting four quarts, I believe, of cold water in the fermenter. Mm -hmm. You add the wort to the fermenter, top it off to eight liters, and give it a good whisking for aeration. And then sprinkle your yeast on, let the yeast rehydrate, another aeration, and it's good to go. So it really takes less than 45 minutes if once you know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a no boil other than getting the water up to temperature to begin with. It's you don't boil the extract because it's a right. hopped extract. Right. You don't want to change the flavor profiles of it. And uh, then step three is bottling and carbonating, uh, and they make it real easy by putting the spigot right there on the front of the uh, the fermenter. So it's a it's a one step fermentation. You don't do a secondary. Uh, right. But I, I I hardly do a secondary anymore myself. So I do them myself either. I used to, but I realize there's not a lot of point to them unless you're I don't know adding fruit or something. But mm-hmm. I never really see a reason to do a secondary. Yeah, we're on the, we're on the same page there. Uh, so you bottle and you prime with uh, sugar in mm-hmm. in the bottle, uh, and then you condition it to to carbonate it, and and then you. You, you chill and drink. So fairly straightforward. Um, yep. But but as we said, the basic kit is probably not going to, if you're, if you're a craft beer lover, is probably not going to give you uh, the best beer possible, right? It make beer. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, it's not to my taste. So what would you recommend to begin with? What are the first steps that you would do to step up a, a Mr. Beer kit? Without getting complicated, the easiest thing to do is to just bypass the recipes with Booster and get their um, deluxe kits, which contain one can of pop malt extract and one can of on hot malt extract. So then you're brewing with all grains, or, you know, it's all grain, so you're not brewing with sugar, basically. Right. So I think that improves it a lot. Um, and, you know, for the beginner, that should be all you need to do to make better beer. You know, down the road, you can do things like steeping grains, and that really opens up a whole new work world for everyone. Now, on the Mr. Beer site, and this sounds like a commercial for Mr. Beer. It's not. <laughs> Neither one of us is being compensated, right? No, but they are a great company. They have great customer service, and they're really out there to just, you know, have people make good beer, and they're real helpful. So on the site, uh, not only do they have hopped extract and unhopped extract, they also have uh, liquid yeast. And if you look at the fine print on the website, it's Y yeast. It is Y yeast. There's smaller packets, though, so they're made specifically for Mr. Beer. Yeah, they're packed specifically for them. You're making two and a half gallons, right? Um, 
technically you're making 2.135 gallons, I believe. <laughs> and I, my recipes myself that I design, I do 2.4 gallons. So they also, in, in addition to, and they're smack packs, right? The little, yep. there's the little smack packs, and they also sell pelletized hops on there. They do. So about the only thing that they don't you don't sell for just a basic extract recipe are the steeping grains. Right, and that will definitely be something that they should be doing in my book because that is basically the next step that most people take is they start, start steeping some grains and then they realize what a difference that makes. But if you don't have a local homebrew supply store, it makes it a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. Now that that was one of the one of the things that um, was kind of a point of contention uh, when we were talking to Mister Beer because we were saying, "Hey, you could do steeping grains," and and he was like, "Whoa, you know, we try to make our our uh, kit instructions very very simple because we want people to have a uh, a goof proof sort of experience and have you know." make good beer and then come back and buy more ingredients and, and do it again. That's great. They should also offer the ability to step up, too. So. Well, I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> but, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, who found a Mr. Beer kit at a, a garage sale and bought it, and I had given him a, an introduction to Extract Home Brewing DVD to kind of try to get him interested in brewing. Uh-huh. Uh, but then he found the Mr. Beer kit and made the Mr. Beer kit. And I said, hey, well, so what would you think? You know, well, it was fun, the fermentation, and I'm making my own beer, and I just think it's great. And I said, well, you know, uh, if you take a look at that DVD, making, you know, a full extract recipe uh, is not too much different from that. But he said, well, but you've got to boil for an hour, though, right? And I said, well, yeah, most recipes, yeah, you got to he said, I just, I got, I got, I don't have the time for that. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely a market out there of people who are, just want it simple, want it easy. Um, but it seems to me that most people who call themselves home brewers at some point want to progress. I agree. And it's a great way to start, but it's fairly limiting. And they've got a great selection of recipes. But you find that most people do want to progress on to the next stage. And some people don't even realize how easy it is to steep grains. I think it sounds complicated to them. <laughs> There's really nothing to it. <laughs> so while we're still at this level, uh, talking about the basic uh, mm-hmm. Mr. Beer kits, what kinds of recipes have you tried of theirs? And and what are the techniques that they, uh, that they recommend to kind of uh, add some complexity? Um. Well, some of the things they recommend a lot is they have a lot of fruit beer recipes on their site. Personally, I don't feel fruit belongs in beer, but (laughs) seems to be one of the ways that they um, suggest to change things up. But on their website, they have, I think it's 176, 180 recipes on there. And generally, they're going to be either an HME, I'm sorry, hop malt extract and an on-hop malt extract and some hops. And generally, even with their hop additions, they keep it really simple. They don't have you boiling the hops for any amount of time. It's usually they, what they call a dry hop, and that's just adding it at flame out. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they don't get overly complicated with their recipes either. So it's generally adding more malt, adding some hops, and there's a wide variety of them on the website of theirs. But yeah, the the second recipe that I made was the Bengal Tiger IPA, which had... Uh, I actually have that in the fermenter right now. Oh, really? Yeah, two weeks ago I didn't have time to do an all-grain batch, so I was like, well, what do I have on hand? And Let me look at their recipes, and I had everything on hand to do that one, so it's going to be ready to bottle here in a couple of days. Well, there you go. Did you follow their recipe exactly? Um, I actually made a point to follow the recipe exactly. I actually used Booster for the first time in I don't know how long. Huh. So, and I had you know, my own Cascades on hand, and I think that's what it called for. Uh, but I stayed pretty true to the recipe, if I remember correctly. 
Yeah, one thing that was I thought was unusual was they uh, they had the recipe called to add the pellet hops as you're going into the fermenter. I'm thinking that's what I didn't do with the recipe. I did actually boil the hops for I think ten minutes. Yeah, so. yeah, that would make sense. And it does seem that pretty much all of their recipes where you're adding hops, they tell you to add it into the fermenter or right at you know, at the end of the boil. So. Yeah, and it's that's not not the best if you that's not really the best place to dry hop <laughs> is before yeah. fermentation because fermentation is going to scrub a lot of those uh, yeah. those volatile hop oils uh, out. Exactly. So, so but what, once again, they're keeping it simple. They don't want people open up the fermenter, you know, four or five days in and throwing things in there. So they really do make sure that they keep it simple and pretty much foolproof. Well, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so if you are a Mr. Beer user and you're listening to this show, you might want to, uh, you know, be careful of sanitation. Uh, you don't want stuff falling in the beer, but uh, wait to add those uh, those pellet hops, uh, at least the ones that they tell you to add into the fermenter. Wait until after fermentation is complete, then add those pellet hops in there, and then you're really you're really dry hopping. I think. You get more bang for your buck that way. Certainly. So how did how did you step up? What was your first step uh, into uh, getting away from just the basic kits? Um, really, I would have to say, I mean, I started out slow, just throwing in hops here and there and that kind of thing, and not, not really knowing what I was doing. Um, I think the biggest change for me initially well, and I did steep some grains, and that was a step up. But it was once I got Jamil's Brewing Classic Styles that I started just buying um, bulk liquid malt extract and doing full recipes out of his book. So that was pretty much my jumping off point. And now I actually do all grain recipes in my little 2.4 gallon batches, ah. <laughs> which my local homebrew supply store makes fun of me for, uh, you know, I don't mind a little ribbon. <laughs> well, hey, you know we, that's our con- the, the whole thing that started this off was uh, was our conversation about uh, brewing in a small space, and well, I, and that's why I, I continue to do it too. Mm-hmm. Um, the the size of the fermenter. I live in a small one bedroom apartment, and I've got a mini fridge and a wine cooler that both have Johnson controllers hooked up to them, and I can fit two Mister Beer kegs in each one. So there's my brewery just off in the corner. And I could not really do five gallons in this apartment. So that's why I continue to do it. It's it's just really convenient for a small apartment. Well, there you go. And if you're if you're making uh, all grain, you're not you're not really making beer with Mr. Beer. You're just using their fermenter. Right. And it still makes me a Mr. Beer user because I am using their fermenter. It's part of their equipment. Um, and like I said, I do still do their recipes. So I mix it up. And and those, uh, as I mentioned on the, the previous show where I talked about it, they they sell those little keg things for like 10 bucks on their site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're really inexpensive. So, yeah. so you got your whole kit for less than what you'd pay uh, for just a, the keg thing. For retail, All right? <laughs> and you know, I started, you know, with the after Christmas clearance sales, and you know, I basically I think I bought three kegs for well, yeah, after a twenty percent off coupon, eight bucks a piece, and, and then I bought one more off their website for ten bucks. So, doing the math, yeah, it's a pretty cheap way to get into the whole hobby. Well, there you go. the 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 email that that uh, that started this ball rolling uh, was from Justin in uh, northern Minnesota uh, who heard me talk about the the Mr. Beer uh, keg in that show. And uh, he sent me an email and said, uh, I started brewing with the Mr. Beer keg and hope to move up to a five-gallon kit soon. Uh, I was wondering if you would consider doing a show on Mr. Beer. I know that Mr. Beer is considered cheesy in the mainstream brewing circle, and some of your fans might not admit it, but I bet a lot of them got their start with Mr. Beer or a similar kit. Some of the complaints about Mr. Beer are simply unfounded. You can do everything with a Mr. Beer that you can do with a five-gallon kit. 
Some of my peers on various Mr. Beer only message boards brew all grain recipes, partial mash recipes. Heck, you name it, they do it. Please consider this a topic for a future show. So, mm-hmm. yeah. He's correct. And then you, he put me in touch with you. So you're 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 proving out his uh, his uh, theory there that uh, you don't have to jump up to a five gallon size, and you don't even have to to do a traditional you know carboy or a traditional pail uh, plastic pail to make good homebrew. Well, one argument you're going to hear is that I'm spending as much time doing an all grain for 2.4 gallons as it takes much time to make 10 gallons. So that is the one drawback. But then again, it is a space issue with me. Um, I can't do a turkey fryer. I have to do everything on the stovetop, and my stove would not bring six gallons of wort to a boil. Mm -hmm. So there's... Advantages and disadvantages, time-wise, I'm spending as much time to make that beer as someone who's getting a lot more beer for the effort. But at the same time, I also get a lot more variety. I'm not drinking five gallons of the same beer at one time. I've got quite the mix of different styles. That's right. And it doesn't take as long to bring up half the quantity of water to boil. Uh, right. So there are some shortcuts. And, and to cool down as well. How do you chill your wort after the boil? Unfortunately, I just do an ice bath. I've never broken down and gotten a wart chiller. So um, I basically do a couple of successions of cold water in the sink until I get the the temperature of the brew pot down some because I found that if you just add ice, it just melts the ice right away. Mm-hmm. So I temper the temperature a little bit and then pour in 10 pounds of ice. And I'm usually down to pitching temperature in about 35 minutes. Now, using the Mr. Beer system to ferment, are there any drawbacks? Is there anything that you could tell uh, someone who's considering doing something similar to what you're doing? Is there anything that you would uh, point them to to change? Well, versus a carboy, not really. Um, I mean, it's just basically a fermentation vessel. And I don't know the science behind um, fermentation geometry, but looking at the fermenter, I almost think it might have a better geometry for fermentation. Um, one thing people might be taken back by is it does not use a traditional airlock. It uses a vented cap. Um, I'm not going to say I've never had an infected batch, but I don't blame it on the system. Hmm. Um, I think, no, there's really not a lot I would change. Um, having the spigot is nice. I don't personally use the spigot. I rack into a bottling bucket. I like to bottle off of the tube. Um, other than that, it's a really well thought out design system. I really wouldn't see anything that needs to be changed. So, <clears throat> so what would we find if we went to, uh, the website that you're a part of the Mr. Beer Um, a lot of helpful people. If you have questions, we're there to answer your questions. Um, there's a whole recipe forum where people post their recipes. Um, under the advanced brewing that you mentioned, um, people will post their all-grain recipes, um, talk about moving up in different styles and systems. Um, one guy's trying to put together his RIMS or HERMS system. He doesn't know what he's going to do, and it's going to be fully automatic. So it really <laughs> runs the gamut from absolute entry-level beginners who have questions about why their beer tastes cidery to people who really know what they're doing. And I mean, we've got one member on there that you know, harvests all his yeast. He never buys yeast but once a year. And it really runs the gamut. You know, it's a great little site where... A tight little family there, and you're you're sharing the enthusiasm and the love of home brewing. Yep, and we basically just are there to help each other out and have a good time. Sometimes it feels like a bar in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, seeing as how I don't go to bars anymore. <laughs> now, well, now that would be a drawback if you uh, if you completely uh, stopped going out uh, to get a beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, ABS my one big event a year. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. And I'm up here in Colorado. So, so what are your favorite uh, of the recipes that you've tried with the Mr. Beer? Just their basic recipes. What are your favorites and why? 
Um, on the basics, what do you mean the basic with the booster? Well, or uh, well, I want to shy away from the booster. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, that's my, that's the first piece of advice. That if uh, here's well, okay, here's my here's my little uh, soapbox with the Mister Beer. Uh, throw throw away the booster. Get another can of uh, extract, probably yep. unhopped. Uh, throw away the little packet of dry yeast. Get some good yeast, uh, liquid yeast, uh, and play with the hops. If you can yep. make, you know, even if you make a, if you don't boil the whole thing, um, you know, make a little hop tea and to to go in there, or, you know, play with dry hopping and and try to step step it up just a bit. Um, those are the main things that I would say to someone who was who had a, a basic Mister Beer kit. Would you go along with that? Yeah. Um. A lot of people do criticize their yeast. I actually still use dry yeast a lot. Um, I like the economy of it. I mainly use Fermentus, though. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a good quality yeast. Um, A lot of people do say that their yeast is not good, but I don't really think that's the case. So I think you can stick with their yeast if you ferment, right? I mean, if you're fermenting at 75 degrees, then, yeah, I would want to adjust my yeast to those temperatures. But... It's it's a hearty yeast. It'll pretty much ferment out anything. So, although I do realize with liquid yeast you can make better beer, but well, let me, let me clarify. I guess uh, I, I use dry yeast most of the time, but it's like the Safale USO five. Right. Uh, it's just the little mystery packs of yeast that you find under the lids of cans that scare, right. scare me. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. And I do um, prefer the Saf Ale and the 04 and the 05. And that's generally what I use. Those are my go-to yeasts. Now, the one one confusing thing, uh, if you go to the Mr. Beer website, you don't see the Y yeast labels Right, they they kind of dumb down the names of the of the yeast, so you and they don't tell you which number it is that you're getting, so you got to kind of guess at that. Right, right. This is why yeast eleven o eight or whatever. It's proprietary to them. They don't like to reveal it for some reason. Yeah. So back so back to my question that I didn't let you answer. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, what are the uh, the recipes that you would recommend? Well. Just going up to the mid-level, which is a can of on-hop malt extract and a can of hopped malt extract. Um, really a simple one that usually comes out really good is what they call their Oktoberfest Vienna Lager. And that's with their mellow amber on-hop malt extract. Um, they call it a lager, but they're fermenting it with ale yeast, unless you want to go all out and lager it. But that comes out as real nice, malty. Um, kind of a good representation of, of an Oktoberfest. Obviously, it's not a lager. Um, if you go with their premium ones, though, those are two cans of hot, hot malt extract, and pretty much all of those recipes, there's not a lot of them, are really good. They've got a couple of different pilsners. There's a wit beer that always comes out good. Um, their American Devil IPA, I don't really find it to be... I kind of like my IPs to be, IPAs to be a little more West Coast, hmm. and this one's kind of middle of the ground. Uh, I'm not a fan of their porter either. I think it's not robust enough, but the oatmeal stout's real good. Any of the ones that are using two HMEs are going to come out pretty good. Well, there you go. Uh, I feel guilty now. I think I, I may go and, and get another uh, get another <laughs> recipe. <laughs> well, you still have the fermenter. That's true, yeah. uh, and I and I and I have used it. It makes a really good. Uh, it, I made some root beer for the kids, and it makes a really good uh, place to mix up the uh, the root beer extract and the sugar and all, and and uh, sure. to bottle the the root beer it was really nice. handy. Your kids too. <laughs> oh well, there you go. And I see they got wine and cider they, too. They started doing. They've always done cider. They just started doing the wine this last fall. So. Do they call it Mister Beer Wine? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like like Monsieur Wine or something. <laughs> yeah, I haven't really looked into it because I'm not much of a wine drinker, so I don't know much about that one. <laughs> well, 
Well, are, are there are there any parting words that you can any any uh, last pieces of advice that we haven't gone over? Well, I mean, I'm glad that you're discussing the topic because I do think that it is maligned a lot. People hear the name Mr. Beer and they think it's just a gimmicky thing, but you can make real beer with it, and it's basically a really good stepping off point. I mean, it's going to tell you whether or not you want to be a home brewer, and you don't have to spend seventy-five to one hundred and fifty dollars to find out. So, it's a great way to get started, and you can make good beer with it, and you can also progress beyond what they sell too. Well, there you go. All righty. Well, I, I I hope that we've we've sent some Mister Beer users over to your site so that you can help them kind of grow their their interest and grow their hobby. Area. All right. Thanks, Derek. Well, thank you, James. Well, thanks again to Derek. If you know somebody who's getting a Mr. Beer kit for Christmas, point them to this show and also point them to MrBeerFans.com and maybe we can get them past the basics, past that watery beer that you initially make with with a Mr. Beer, with a booster and all that stuff, and uh, get them past that and into the world of making great beer at home. So... Let's help our Mr. Beer uh, siblings, as it were, make better beer. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our 2010 Brewers logbooks are in and going out, so uh, get yours before the uh, beginning of the year. We've also got our Reinheitsgebot is a four-letter word shirts on our shop as well, and those are also going out the door. You can check out our homebrewing DVDs on our website, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kids. And we got combo deals on our site if you want to save a couple of bucks, or you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. And as I said at the beginning of the show, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, especially during this holiday season. We appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Jamaican Hot Yellow Scotch Bonnet Pepper, 15 Seeds. Wow. Wow. Warms me up just thinking about it. And Logo Font and Lettering Bible. Where you'll find passages like, Thou shalt not kern. <laughs> or you'll go straight to Helvetica. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. And we appreciate your support. And that goes along for our associate links with the American Homebrewers Association and Brew Your Own Magazine on our site as well. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.